Welcome to Searching for the Question Live. My name is David Orban, and I am very glad to have you following the show. Uh, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube. I invite you to subscribe to our YouTube channel, of course. Uh, and uh, if you find uh, these uh, pieces of content that uh, we create uh, valuable, uh, you can also become a supporter on Patreon at patreon.com slash David Orban. Today, uh, we are going to talk about uh, uh, wonderful ways of thinking about the future. Uh, uh, futurists are often and, and, and often rightly accused of being uh, very vague in, in their predictions. Uh, uh, oh, everything is out uh, 10 years in the future, and it is uh, often hard to nail them down why are they predicting something? What is the uh, basis of their predictions? Uh, but uh, it is even more surprising to think about how scientifically and, and, and mathematically even, you can think about deeper futures, farther out, um, not only tens, uh, but thousands or millions or billions uh, of years in the future. And then, of course, uh, project out what uh, our expectations can be about those futures in terms of our values, our um, ambitions, our aims, our objectives. And uh, the tools and the quality of the reasoning actually matters because then you can um, take the results and ask yourself, is this what I want? And if it is not, can I do something about it? So we are talking about these topics with uh, my friend uh, Anders uh, Sandberg, who is a researcher uh, at uh, uh, the uh, Oxford-based uh, Future of uh, Humanity Institute. So welcome, Anders, to Searching for the Question Live. Thank you. It's great to be here. So uh, before we start talking about uh, billions of years in the future, um, I uh, prepared um, uh, Google Earth, which I always like to show around uh, so that our uh, followers can see uh, where uh, the, the, the guest is. Uh, and, and this is Oxford and uh, the very iconic uh, uh, buildings from the Middle Ages. Uh, that constitute the various colleges. Uh, but uh, actually, you told me uh, before we started that uh, that you are now in, in Sweden. Are you in Stockholm? Yes, indeed. Um, so I'm uh, taking the risk of getting up to wild Sweden, uh, which is, of course, very enjoyable in summer. I, I've been spending essentially all spring cooped up in my library in Oxford, which is also quite delightful. Uh, so, so you were able to uh, uh, move uh, uh, before the lockdown happened all over? Well, in this case, it's kind of moving in the late phases. So if I were to go back to the UK, of course, I would have to be in quarantine for two weeks. Then again, being an academic nerd, I would be stuck in my library with my computer and I could work just as well as normal. So I'm not that uh, fast about it. Uh, and um, it is it is um, very of course uh, uh, fascinating to 
to imagine you uh, as you go to work every day do you have to wear the robes of an oxford don and and do you have to put on the white uh, uh, hairpiece uh, I don't have to. Uh, actually, the, in the office, it's, of course, quite normal uh, dress code. I'm, of course, the one that is breaking it a little bit by being a little bit more of a fancy dresser. I actually don't own a robe yet. But I recently became a fellow of an entirely new college, currently named Parks College, but probably going to change name to Rubin College. And then I assume I will actually have to get my proper robe. The, the real thing I need to bring to the office every time is, of course, having enough coffee and uh, enough whiteboard uh, pens, because quite often when I end up in the Future Humanity Institute offices, I don't get to my own office before somebody grabs me in front of a whiteboard. Have you seen this? Yeah, that I, 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 I imagine that uh, so much of the uh, academic life is bouncing ideas uh, off uh, uh, one another uh, cross-fertilizing uh, the development of uh, various uh, lines of thought uh, and uh, that uh, solitary uh, thinking uh, is important, but uh, only when uh, you have been able to debate and to, and to flesh out the ideas together with others. Yeah, uh, th there is something to be said for drilling very, very deep on one question, really obsessing about it in solitude for a long time to really come up with your own unique thinking. The problem is, of course, quite often somebody else has been thinking about that before and solved the problem in a much neater way. So the, an hour uh, uh, googling around or going to the library can save you a month in the lab, as they say. And conversely, realizing what you ought to be working what questions should I be asking or trying to answer is a really important thing. And this is where you need a community and ideally people thinking in different ways from you. So we are very lucky at my institute that we have this mixture of people from philosophy and engineering and law and uh, the policy and uh, the biosafety. So we have very different approaches, which sometimes of course means that we bicker quite a bit because we don't even recognize that approach as why would you ever think that makes sense? And it's in those discussions about why does this make sense? Why do we do it like this over in my department that you then start realizing, oh, you could actually combine this with that and actually start working on something that seems to be really important and neither of the original departments care about. And uh, uh, did you? how did you end up at the Future of Humanity Institute? What uh, brought you uh, there? Uh, did you uh, plan to be a, a researcher slash philosopher in kindergarten already? Uh, I was planning to become a scientist in kindergarten. Uh, the problem was, and I realized this many years later, I had actually no correct idea about what a scientist did. I have been watching television. I knew white lab coats were important, and test tubes and dinosaurs and lasers and adventure and inventions. Now, my life is relatively free from dinosaurs and test tubes. I have some laser pointers and I do some ill-advised chemistry experiments sometimes. But generally, the depiction of what science is about in public media is not good. And then, of course, growing up reading science fiction still gave me a very loose idea about it. Fortunately for me, since I ended up in the science, I realized, actually, I do like this. It's very different from what I imagined as a kid. But I do like exploring the unknown. And even though that might be done on our computer, a whiteboard rather than uh, out in a jungle, which is, frankly is way more convenient to be in an office than out in a wet jungle full with leeches and other stuff, um, that is fascinating. There are adventures out there. And some of these adventures, they are even more exciting than anything with the dinosaurs. And, and uh, that is uh, an important remark in terms of uh, the difference between what uh, one imagines uh, that one is attracted to and then uh, discovers the reality of the thing itself and then establishing whether the difference is such that uh, uh, it, it should be abandoned or, or, or rethought or that the difference between that imagined uh, and, 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 the, and the reality uh, is not too, too large. And this is, this is true in, uh, in a profession that one uh, chooses or ends up uh, practicing or 
uh, even in personal relationships uh, uh, actually and 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 modeling and then comparing the models to uh, real outcomes is part of uh, our uh, instinctive uh, scientific attitude uh, actually so uh, you have been practicing science before knowing science yeah uh, the the tricky part about science if you read the definition is something like the systematic search for knowledge i think we are always searching for knowledge we're looking around uh, we get curious about things uh, we update our knowledge about the world but most of us don't try to do that in a systematic way I'm really lousy at the systematic part myself because I always get carried away by something exciting. This is where a bit of training is useful. This is where feeling a bit of guilt when you do certain things uh, because you realize, mm, this is not systematic enough. I feel the ghost of Karl Popper showing up saying, oh, Anders, you need to check falsifiability. And I sometimes have my mental model of uh, my colleagues like Nick Bostrom uh, uh, kind of hanging over my shoulder saying, yeah, does this matter? What's the so what answer? And couldn't you put this in a neat way? Developing these habits, it's not natural, but it's quite useful. And sometimes you can apply them in real life. And sometimes you realize this works in one part of science or one part of life, but not others. Why? One of the coolest things about hanging out with philosophers, technically we are in the philosophy department, is of course, they ask the meta questions. Uh, not just why did this work, but why does this kind of thing work in many situations, or why it doesn't work? And that kind of question in itself, can it be answered or not answered? Sometimes that goes off into the clouds and uh, just turns into weird questions of grammar. But sometimes you realize patterns that are very powerful and allow you to actually zoom in on what truly matters. Um, before you said that uh, um, part of uh, the importance of being uh, a member of the scientific community is that uh, you are able to focus on the questions that are worth asking rather than just random questions or questions that are interesting, but indeed somebody else has already uh, asked it and the answers that they found were very uh, good and, and maybe you won't be able to give a better answer. What are the tools, apart from researching the literature, that allow you uh, this uh, systematic uh, understanding of where to search for good questions? Uh, is there a do we um, uh, system for uh, ca of categorizing uh, scientific research or philosophical uh, research, and you find the holes uh, in? In, in the shelf, the abstract shelf of articles, and you say, okay, I want to fill that hole? Well, that's one approach. Uh, the, the problem is, of course, it's not easy to detect an absence of something. So that's already a good thing. But quite a lot of questions probably don't matter. Uh, there is a, literally an infinite amount of questions that one could pursue, but most of them wouldn't change the world. So you should probably start from the opposite direction. If this question were answered now, how would that change things? And that's, of course, already a little bit of a prediction. And uh, we're not always good at even making a sensible stab at that. But I could, for example, consider mm, here is a mathematical problem, and here is something related to biosecurity, biosafety. Now, if I were to solve that mathematical problem, how much better would the future be? Well, it's kind of nice, but the biosafety one, mm, if I could make an improvement on that one, it would actually have bigger effects, partially because it might save a lot of lives uh, and uh, make sure we get them. So often you want to figure out the hints that the quest really, really matters. So one nice trick we have borrowed from our friends in the effective altruism community is thinking about three factors. One is scale. Does this matter for a lot of things? whether that is a lot of people or having a big impact on the future, or this is a general scheme that works on a lot of different questions. The second one is tractability. Does it look like one could actually do something useful here? There are some questions that are brilliant, but probably impossible to deal with. We don't have any hint on how to deal with that. And the final one is neglectedness. Has people been overlooking it? Is there a hole in the library about that? And sometimes, there is a good reason for nobody actually being interested in a question because every time you try it, you will discover that, 
oh, this is actually not working at all, or it's actually pointless, or it doesn't have a big impact. But sometimes that's very useful to do a bit of research and then flag it saying, okay, I looked into this, there's nothing here. So we know that we should look somewhere else. But quite often you find that if you're the first at looking at any question, you can of course increase the amount of knowledge about that question almost infinitely from the zero you started on. And then uh, you can uh, both feel very smug, haha, I discovered quite a big chunk of knowledge about this. And we can start making better decisions about the future of it. This is also why our institute deal quite a bit with questions other academics find odd or weird, and no, no serious person looks into that. Well, that means that uh, either there's a good reason no serious person looks into it, or it can quite often be that everybody just follows everybody else, and uh, we end up missing important things. This is how we got into AI safety long before it was cool. And we, then we were somewhat lucky, of course, that uh, Nick Bostrom's book came out just at the same time as the new deep neural network were doing amazing things. That was not planned. I wish we could say that uh, we were sitting around in our office thinking, yeah, and in a few years, neural networks are really going to take off. And that was not the case. We were thinking about it because it seemed to be an under-researched and potentially important question. And then we happened to be uh, lucky about it. In other cases, it's important to figure out why a question doesn't. I've been interested in people worried about particle accelerators causing global disasters, for example. There's a lot of different theories about how that could happen, and they don't seem to matter. Uh, you mean but, uh, the LHC creating a black hole? Yeah. Uh, now, the interesting thing here is that's not taken out of thin air. It was based on actual physics papers. Other physicists have been talking about strangelets or vacuum decay and a whole host of interesting phenomena in theoretical physics, but you don't want them in your lab. You definitely don't want them on your planet. Uh, so many people were, were rightly worried that you physicists talk about these weird things, but uh, now you're trying to do experiments that might produce them. Aren't you worried about the experts? At that point, the physicists were in a little bit of a quandary. They were not used to people being worried about uh, destroying the world. And at first, they just dismiss it. Oh, it's no risk whatsoever. And then people ask a very se sensible question. How do you know there is no risk whatsoever? Given that you're trying to do cutting edge physics here, you actually do the experience because you don't know the actual physics of the universe. You have earlier mentioned these scary and interesting possibilities. How can you now say that there is zero risk? The physicist went back into the offices in a huff and came back with a bunch of papers arguing why there is no risk. And they had good arguments. Uh, for example, there is the cosmic ray argument. Earth has been hit by cosmic rays for a very long time with higher energies. So if something bad happens uh, there, in that case, we would not be here. Now, sensible people would realize, wait a minute, if we, if we couldn't exist in that world, we would not see it. Maybe we've just been lucky. We're on one of the few plants that haven't blown up. So you can adjust the, the, the argument, say, yeah, look at the moon instead. And you need to patch the argument surprisingly much. I wrote a paper where I showed that you need to do a certain, uh, rather surprisingly large amount of patching to get robust arguments that can handle all the uncertainties and fallibilities in our physics. But it is possible to bound risks. It's not like we have to just throw up our hands and say, oh, uh, be what may, uh, whatever happens, happens. You can do bounds, but you need to take into account the fallibility of uh, physicists and arguments and theories. It's doable. Now, the fun part is the conclusion is not that the LHC is dangerous, but rather, oh, we need to do risk assessment in a better way, especially about these really low probability weird risks we don't understand. Well. And uh, uh, this kind of methodology that you described, I think, is very healthy exactly because it represents an antidote uh, to many uh, issues that are plaguing uh, uh, science as it is practiced today, depending on funding, uh, funding in turn, uh, depending on the popularity of a given subject, the popularity of the subject being driven by uh, the ability from a political point of view of uh, the, the leader of that particular subfield to corral um, postdocs and, and uh, publications or put his name on, on popular publications. And, and uh, you mentioned physics. Uh, 
the uh, inability of uh, string theory uh, to uh, produce uh, um, experimental, uh, ex experimentally verifiable results that would back any of the 10 to the 100 uh, theories that they can uh, pull out of the hat uh, did not stop it from homogenizing uh, the field of, uh, of theoretical physics to the point where any alternative voice uh, is uh, running the risk of being a dead end for uh, the professional development and the career uh, of, uh, of a budding uh, scientist who will think uh, twice uh, before um, uh, being attached uh, to an alternative uh, uh, branch uh, of, of uh, theories uh, that would not be that, uh, that popular. Uh, also, you, you mentioned uh, uh, the, um, uh, the fact that just because uh, a, a given field is, is not popular, that doesn't mean that it, it is necessarily wrong. Um, I, I love uh, heterodoxy uh, in, in which uh, the, um, uh, the, almost the, the, the uh, opposite image of the dominating uh, rule set is, uh, becomes a pattern. Uh, by itself uh, to, to search for uh, interesting things, where, of course, um, as, a, as, a, as a non, uh, uh, as somebody who doesn't belong to, to uh, academia, I, on one hand, uh, can run the risk uh, of uh, doing uh, crazier things. Uh, on the other hand, I have uh, fewer uh, restraints uh, of being crazy uh, my myself, so the balance there is always uh, delicate. Uh, yeah, I am, and, and having that kind of spread of ideas, I think, is very important. Uh, in some fields, you don't really need much spread because we understand them really well. A lot of parts of classical mechanics, yeah, we've been doing this for a few centuries. We roughly know what we're doing, but there are many domains where things are not as settled as people would like to think, uh, and. Uh, Actually, spreading out and trying many different things is the rational thing. To do. I recently read an interesting uh, paper from a, a Breakthrough Listen project. So they're uh, looking at using various telescopes around the world and uh, to listen for signals uh, originating from extraterrestrial intelligence. And this field, of course, has a long history, and it started with radio astronomers essentially trying to take the astronomers uh, on other planets. It was very much based at the start from the assumption that uh, the astronomers everywhere in the universe are probably a little bit alike. People were complaining about that, and gradually we realized that mm, actually looking for kind of industrial side effects of civilization might be a good idea. But critics pointed out again that maybe they're really alien. What should they actually look for? And this particular paper had this wonderful idea that, yeah, we should uh, look both at the things that are most likely to be uh, the home of internet life, but also all other stuff. Essentially, try to listen in uh, for every type of object. We have no clue whether the, the white dwarf stars might actually be a good thing. Nobody really thinks so, but uh, we should try. We should make a list of all the possible objects. We should also look at the most extreme objects and the ones we really, really don't understand. And we should also look at things that we are pretty certain absolutely cannot be intelligent life. If you just look straight up in the sky and you just, your program starts saying, oh, I'm getting signals here, then either there is a UFO hovering over your telescope or more likely you have done something wrong. So they're spreading out search, not just looking at what you would like and it would make sense to look at, but also the others. And I think we need to do that much more in academia. Our rewards tend to be go where the grants are know where the cool researchers are. So we tend to cluster and quite often that ends up being research looking for the keys under the lamppost because there's a lot of light there. Usually big revolutions in science happen when a new tool becomes available so that we can see a different part of the world. A lot of people scurry over and discover all sorts of amazing stuff. Uh, and that really shows that there is probably quite a lot of, of things out there in the darkness. Um, the the beauty of being uh, live is that uh, people can uh, uh, say hello. We have Romina uh, um, uh, commenting us, uh, and also a mutual acquaintance, uh, Stefano Sutti, uh, sending his regards and saying, "Long time no see." Yeah. Um, 
we, uh, you and I, uh, Anders, actually uh, met uh, the first time when uh, probably, as I remember, uh, in the online uh, zine, uh, Boing Boing, uh, I saw Cory Doctorov uh, blogging about your uh, warning signs from the future series uh, that uh, something like 15 years ago or more, uh, I uh, uh, used uh, in a presentation of uh, mine because these are very funny and 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 also very thought uh, provoking, and some of them uh, over the course of the years uh, have uh, become even more uh, relevant. Uh, we don't have uh, non-standard space time or or um, stable uh, strange lets, uh, but. Uh, uh, definitely, the fact that uh, macro-scale quantum systems could be around uh, is is uh, becoming accepted, uh, and uh, uh, definitely ubiquitous surveillance, lack of internet connectivity, uh, self-improving software, group intellect. These are daily preoccupations of an increasing uh, number of people, especially policymakers and regulators, who are appointed to make decisions that they are totally ill-equipped to, to, to make. Uh, do you find it that uh, your uh, research or at least uh, overall uh, the research of uh, the future uh, of uh, Humanity Institute at Oxford where you work uh, is um, sufficiently, um, uh, sufficiently requested or involved uh, by uh, uh, regulators and policymakers, or they are they are kind of ignored, unfortunately. There is a bit of a mixture. <clears throat> the, the problem is, uh, many policymakers would love to hear us tell them what to do. I, I'm not certain they would actually like it if we could tell them what to do. Uh, generally, policymakers are like to make the policy themselves, but. Quite often what we are trying to deal with is a bit more deeper questions, the kind of questions lying at the root of uh, the whole issue. Is this something that matters? Is this a general tool that works well? So our tools are not really the ideal thing for the uh, politician who is up in uh, uh, trying to decide the exact what. Sometimes we do come with relatively concrete advice. Our AI governance project, for example, is looking very much at how do we make sure we set up the ground rules for making artificial intelligence safe and beneficial across the world? And that is quite applied. Uh, some of the technical AI safety stuff is more like we need to get the engineers to incorporate certain methodologies here to make this better. But some of the deeper issues, the macro strategy, if you want, if you want uh, that is not really for the decision makers. We want tell them about it so they can think about it 20 years from now. We want to actually bring up useful tools that we tell all the people who make good decisions, whether that is in private life in, uh, or in business or in uh, setting up society. <clears throat> Generally, uh, we have found that quite a lot of people in government have been quite interested in this, but it's more useful to have a government mm -hmm. think tank and the civil servants make a long-term plan rather than the guy trying to get re-elected next year. And the real problem is, of course, that uh, politicians quite often are short term because they think they need to be short term to get really. And the voters are complaining that the politicians are short term. Uh, so, and, uh, and the, the problem here is both of them kind of miss what's going on. Both expect the other one to be the one to blame. I think it's partially the party system in many countries. So, what's going on is you want to add the useful insights. We did a report about malicious uses of AI, for example, a while ago. And it's relatively near term by our own standard. But it contained both scenarios that are vivid enough to make people see what the problem is. And somewhat helpful suggestions, at least, yes, decisions. Oh, we're not going to be experts on security engineering or how to set up right laws about liability about it. But we can point out the right problems. Um. So let's uh, start and talk about uh, deep futures, uh, optimal or maximal futures, uh, the perspectives of uh, human civilization uh, and uh, of intelligence in the universe in general. 
you have made uh, some some uh, publications around this and and frameworks of how to think about the the, the problem. So, yeah. how long do we have? Well, if we play our cards right, I think proton decay is uh, the big uh, the, the curtains uh, for intelligence in the universe. Okay, That's and and, uh, and the did we, did we establish? Yeah, did, did we establish uh, that yet? Because I thought the uh, the the experiments uh, looking for Cherenkov radiation in very well shielded uh, uh, water tanks, etc., uh, came to the conclusion that it is. 10 to the 80 at least, or maybe more, that basically they didn't establish that protons would decay. Yeah, so, so this is an interesting example of the problem of prediction, uh, because empirically we have never ever seen a proton decay in any way we can tell. Uh, so some people would say, yeah, so shouldn't we always assume protons are totally stable as long as we haven't seen it happen? But it turns out that most theories in theoretical physics about how stuff works give you some form of proton decay. So the original reason was the grand unified theories uh, and supersymmetry. They kind of imply proton decay uh, one way or another. Uh, and even if you say, yeah, let's just use the standard model, which we believe, there is also a proton decay uh, process, a speller, spelleron, or however it's pronounced, uh, which is very unlikely and that's very slow. We also have kind of quantum gravity. We don't know the theory, but it seems very plausible that you get quantum black holes gobbling up protons. Basically, you get about seven or eight different reasons why we should expect some form of proton decay. Now, the annoying part here is all these reasons are based on theoretical physics. They're all scribbles on white books. So how much do we believe them? So one argument might be maybe it's 50% chance that each of them is a correct theory. In that case, still, it's a pretty high probability that we get proton decay. So then you might argue, can we to even talk about the probability of theories being right? Which is one of the areas I've been interested in research. Now, what I do in my work, I'm working on this big book about grand futures, is that when I have this uncertainty, you can follow both branches. You can say, what if there is proton decay and what if there isn't? So if there is proton decay, we know it has to be really, really slow. Otherwise, we would have noticed it. But we can predict that that means curtains for intelligent life after some very, very long uh, period of time. And I can even try different time scales. Basically, it turns out that uh, it doesn't matter very much uh, which time scale I use because the ordering of other events. Or I can say, maybe there is no proton decay for some weird reason we don't understand. What is the future like in that case? So this is one approach, of course, to deal in dealing with future. You build scenarios. You take mutually exclusive cases or extreme cases and see what the spectrum would be between them. And you can work out details quite uh, nicely, at least in this area, because we actually have fairly nice physics that describe these systems. It's usually easier to talk about the extremely far future than the near future. Well, uh, at least uh, uh, there is uh, no chance that uh, you'll be found out to be wrong uh, soon enough. We'll see about that. Uh, I, I like to stand around and have to make excuses in 10 to the 40 years saying, OK, I wrote some stupid stuff in my youth, but uh, I blame the intoxicating starlight of that uh, remote era. OK, I was totally wrong. I'm going to change the next edition of my book. Hence, hence your, your medal on your neck, right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm signed up for cryonics. So uh, I'm making a bet that uh, future medical technology might be good enough to revive me if I'm frozen bo and heal both uh, the damage from the cryonic suspension and whatever was killing me. I'd rather stay alive by not dying, of course. And, uh, and um, if um, it were the case that uh, you decided cryonics was less likely to work than uploading your mind, would you choose mind uploading first or instead, or you would still do both? Uh, how would you go about that? Well, the nice thing about cryonics is that uh, that is a way of preparing your brain for being scanned rather well. Right now, I don't think there is any plausible method we can uh, scan the neural structure of our brain in a non-destructive manner 
while it's still uh, alive and uh, warm and wet and moving around, you probably need to fixate it. Uh, there are some interesting arguments about whether it really advanced nano medicine could do it, but that's going to be quite a while. Generally, I would prefer to be virtual than physical, because then you can, of course, download to a physical body or an, an existing multiple copies and have backups. There's quite a lot of great advantages. But I only know it's possible to exist as a physical Anders right now. So the cautious approach is, of course, to make sure this body works well enough, long enough, and then get a chance to see that, mm, well, it worked in the lab experiments and the test subjects are not complaining about uh, the mind uploading. And they actually do seem to have uploaded their minds. They actually seem to be conscious and writing poetry and behaving like before. In that case, I might want to take a step. But I'd rather not be the first guinea pig. Uh, did you estimate uh, the probability distribution of the, 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 the likelihood of uh, you being alive over various orders of magnitude of uh, uh, futures? I haven't done a proper model of this, but I made a kind of rough estimation. So the, the main thing is, of course, that I can do a totally normal estimation of my remaining life probability distribution just by using a mortality table. If I want to be a bit more fancy and sophisticated, I might also say, yeah, but we know these mortality tables need to be updated. So I can even do an extrapolation based on that. And that's going to give me a few extra years. Now, there is also some probability, which I think is a fairly decent probability, that life extension methods actually are going to go. There are amazing things happening in the lab. That people are more and more ready to commercialize it, and there might be breakthroughs in uh, public understanding and policymaker understand that we can actually extend life. That would mean that I would also need to now add a fudge factor that a certain probability, let's say one in three, uh, that you get a radical extension of biological life. Then I would, of course, need to model well, uh, the probability of dying before that and the probability of cryonics working. And at this point, of course, my probability model is going to be somewhat messy. It's going to be a page of code or something. But I get an extra way of getting to the future. Basically, I do believe that there is a form of longevity escape velocity that's likely to happen if we get enough radical technology. So you can estimate it. And basically what I end up with is something like, yeah, there is a bump of probability that I live a few decades more. And then there is this long tail that might be very, very, very long. Because it seems to me that the conditions where you could survive for a very long time, because you have advanced nanotechnology, really useful AI, brain emulation techniques, good backups. If you get to them and so you have already survived the powers of those technologies, because these technologies are risky on their own. Having powerful autonomous systems, even if they're not super intelligent, having powerful nanotechnology, these are risks for the world that you need to get past. Once we've done that, especially if we become multiplanetary, the risk goes down quite a bit. Again, we can calculate some of the more extreme risk like uh, vacuum decay, and we can uh, think about uh, gamma ray bursts. They add a little bit of risk. So in the end, of course, just assuming copies, etc., uh, I can actually get a long tail going off to prototype. Long before that is also pretty likely, of course, that uh, I would have turned into something I would not currently recognize as a continuation of. There is a deep philosophical question about super radical life extension. Some people have enough trouble with cryonics. Would the person coming out of the freezer actually be you? Uh, and things get even more iffy, of course, if you do brain emulation. Many people have a real problem with the personal continuity goes there. And then you start upgrading and modifying yourself. My argument is that I'm kind of happy with being a big equivalence class of Anders like processes. Uh, if they retain enough similarity, then I count them. And I can also realize that there is a kind of future horizon of my personal identity. Currently, I don't think uh, certain things would be me, but by, uh, in a century's time, I might have changed my mind. Just like kid me, who was wrong about what science was uh, and would not really understand what uh, I'm doing right now, uh, might uh, say, okay, that old guy, he, is he really me? Nah. But the con uh, continuous development from that kid to my present self has been fairly continuous. And all the steps match up and we could kind of together go through the steps and say, yeah, 
that is a valid development. That's a valid change in opinion. That's a valid change in personality. So in this and, case, okay. yeah. This is a little bit uh, the, the meaning and the reason for letters to your future self and letters to your past self, uh, connecting the threads of, of identity and allowing uh, uh, the um, radius of tolerance in order to inclusively accept a diverging um, uh, set of uh, 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 character features that represent you uh, uh, to be uh, admitted in, in the class uh, of, of distribution of, of, of who you are. Yeah, uh, and there are, of course, ongoing debates, you could say, between myself. So, uh, what changes would I find acceptable? Uh, what about the future answers to keep religious? Uh, would I be okay with that or not? Uh, and so on. I think it's actually quite useful to sometimes think about one's life narrative and be critical about it and recognize both that it's very practical but also something that is somewhat precious to oneself and one should try to handle it well. There is something to be said about a temporal golden rule. Treat uh, yourselves and information in the past like you want to be. Uh, we right now have amazing powers to investigate the past, find uh, what our ancestors were up to genetically, and indeed the discovery and fidelity is going back many generations. Maybe we should be a bit careful about that because we don't want future generations to use their hyper technology to discover embarrassing things about us. Yeah, we might not necessarily be around to be embarrassed by it, but even knowing that uh, somewhere some post are smugly sitting in the cloud and kind of saying uh, naughty things about us, mm, yeah, that's a bit annoying. Of course, the best thing would be to end up on the cloud with them and say, yeah, that's not how I felt about it at the time. Well, uh, it, it is the constant fear uh, of those who don't want to uh, receive uh, life extension or mind uploading treatment against uh, their own will. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I think that it is uh, fair uh, to confirm that the right to die uh, will be uh, very much respected, just as the right to be forgotten uh, in uh, Europe uh, is a law and uh, Google uh, serves different uh, results in a search uh, if you do it in the US or in Europe uh, as a consequence to that. And I don't know whether there will be different branches of uh, civilization where in some branches the right to die will not be uh, in existence and, and you will be revived even if you didn't want to. Yeah. Uh, so, so that leads to this interesting question about what trajectories are open for us. Uh, because the standard picture of the future people have, if you do a survey, uh, people tend to be relatively gloomy about the future. They don't think that far into the future. Uh, beyond 10 to 20 years, uh, it becomes very, very hazy. They use standard pictures, typically drawn from science fiction movies, uh, to talk about various possibilities. And they're also fairly optimistic about their own future. It's kind of interesting to talk to teenagers and they're having this super dystopian climate disaster future of global surveillance and uh, all the bad things you read about in the newspaper. And they imagine a very bright and nice future for themselves. It doesn't actually hang together logically at all. But most of the time, of course, that's because nobody calls out that futures are inconsistent. People talking about the future at least have to make sure the story sounds a little bit more consistent. Many people get very annoyed when the future uh, you present is a mess. Um, for example, uh, uh, James Martin, who uh, uh, donated a lot of money to Oxford and actually helped setting up our institute, his book, The Meaning of the 21st Century, is really annoying because it's both utopian and dystopian at the same time. I've seen audiences go so confused because he, at one moment he's talking about suitcase nukes, and then how quantum computing is going to improve a lot of things. And then it's climate disaster and then discussions about cultural renaissance in climate refugee cities in North Siberia. You're not allowed to say that the future could be good and bad at the same time. But if we look around, of course, to the actual world, this is totally true. Right now, we're kind of locked down because of a global pandemic and there are various populist movements going around. And... We're making advances in AI. We're communicating freely over the internet. Uh, we're solving a lot of problems. Poverty is going down. 
this is an inconsistent story. It's a really bad story in a sense if this had been fiction, because it's not got any particular theme. But that's reality, of course. Reality doesn't actually have proper themes. So when trying to think about long-term futures, the problem is there is this tendency that you might want to make a scenario that's pure, that is just going in one direction. And it's also easier to analyze. You're really tempted to do it. But reality tends to be super messy. This is another problem, of course, about looking at history and the future on a too close up perspective, because then the details will overwhelm you. On the other hand, when I'm getting to proton decay, it's just physics. Everything is so nice in the very long term future because it's all based on relatively simple minded physics and the cosmology. We might be uncertain about what the dark matter is up to, but it's not like it's conspiring against. It's not like it's having fashions. Humans do. If you must know that you're trying to predict what we're doing, they're going to do something weird just to annoy you. And that is, of course, why both humans are very valuable and interesting, but also why it's nice to take a step very far back, because then you might be able to see patterns. Um, the Fermi paradox is the observation by Enrico Fermi, and I imagine him uh, uh, smoking a cigarette as he's uh, watching the... Uh, Terse uh, desert sky in Los Alamos, uh, together with Oppenheimer, as they take a break from uh, designing the atomic bomb, uh, uh, looking up and saying, "Where the fuck is everybody?" And that yeah. is not how it is uh, written up. Uh, but uh, the fact that we are not observing uh, uh, alien technological civilizations. Uh, uh, has been uh, bothering uh, a lot of people for a long time. I have a book actually um, entitled uh, uh, 151 Answers uh, to the Fermi Paradox. So what is uh, the most likely answer in your opinion? Yeah, I, I would like to remark also, this is a beautiful example of that taking a step back. The reason I've been doing research on the Fermi Paradox or the Fermi question, which I think is the proper way, is that if there was a lot of alien civilization we could see, we could say something about the statistics of civilization surviving and thriving. But uh, we don't see them. And that might be evidence that civilizations don't thrive at all. So this, uh, one of the possible scary reasons might be that intelligent life dies out. During the Cold War, it was, of course, plausible that maybe everybody discovers nuclear weapons and nuke themselves. But it could also be that we're alone or that there is, there is watching us from afar, or that there is a low technology ceiling. Almost any answer to the Fermi question has really profound implications for our own future. So that's why we started. So the paper you were showing, Dissolving the Fermi Paradox, is about how people have been doing a slight mistake when reasoning about it. So there is the Drake equation, which is very famous, and a loose attempt at estimating how many civilizations are there uh, out in the Milky Way. So you string together a bunch of factors, the number of new stars per year, uh, the number of planets uh, per star, uh, the, the fraction of Earth-like planets, the ones that have uh, uh, life, the ones uh, that develop intelligence, the, the fraction of intelligent civilizations that uh, communicate, and how long they do. We don't know these numbers very well, and people uh, we have good guesses for the first ones, and we're very uncertain about the data. And the typical thing that happens is that people say, yeah, I'm going to make some guesses here. And then what they do is that they end up with a number at the end, and it might be a very hopeful, oh, there should be thousands of civilizations in the Milky Way. Or they end up with roughly one, and they say, oh dear, we are the only one. But the problem is, they admitted they were uncertain. And now we say they have an answer. But uncertainty involves probability distributions. And uh, what we did in our paper was actually to show that if you try to do probability distribution, and given the knowledge we have today, you do end up with a very weird probability distribution that might allow that there could be quite a lot of aliens out there that we have not yet discovered. But also, there is a big chunk of probability that we're alone in the visible universe. The reason for this slightly paradoxical result is that they're really uncertain about the probability of life. And it's very uncertain. Literally hundreds of orders of magnitude of uncertainty, which is way more than we normally encounter in science. That means that 
you can't rule out that life emerges on practically every planet with a puddle, or it practically never happens. We happen to be one of the very lucky ones in the observable universe. Similarly, intelligence might run into a uh, uh, dead end, or it might actually be very common. Now, the interesting thing about this is that this dissolves the Fermi paradox to some extent. An empty sky is not that surprising. And it's also not giving us the terrible news. Because the, the uncertainty actually means that well, an empty sky is not too t uh, strong evidence that uh, uh, we're doomed. We, we can even do some other st fancy statistics on this to actually see that, yeah, if we got some evidence that there are no aliens on our story, that's a very weak update. It's just a single star. In, in, in. It still updates some things more than others. So this is reassuring. So this line of reason has forced me to conclude that my best bet right now is that we're probably pretty alone. I think that there are probably intelligent life elsewhere in the universe. It just might be very far away, literally billions of light years. Now, I think that might mean that we will meet them in a billion years. So we might still have a chance to meet and greet. Uh, but uh, that's kind of my best. I've written other papers where I propose other explanations, like they're all sleeping. I mean, three degrees of, of absolute uh, zero. You can't do any thinking at these temperatures. You want to wait until very late eras to do a lot more computation. Uh, but I do think that the most likely bet is actually intelligence is scarce, which also means that, oh, we better get our own act together because we might be it. Absolutely. Um, I, I always felt that the Newtonian uh, assumption uh, hypothesis non-fingo, I don't uh, uh, pursue a hypothesis, I collect facts and formulate theories uh, fitting the facts, was uh, uh, disingenuous. Um, I believe that uh, there is um, always a little bit of an ontological component in the scientific endeavor uh, where uh, the researcher sets out uh, to uh, to actually uh, fit the world to uh, what uh, he or she is uh, seeing in the experiments or the kind of theoretical framework that uh, is more comf comfortable with. Um, I, so, I, so a postmodernist would, of course, say, yeah, everything is theory laden. That's kind of a fancy academic speak for the same thing. But yeah, we're always using these tools and then we're forcing reality to fit our tools a little bit. Uh, sure. uh, I, I gave a talk uh, um, in New York a few years ago uh, entitled uh, 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 Ontological Cosmology, uh, where I stated that I uh, prefer. Uh, living in a universe uh, where faster than light uh, travel is impossible because I don't want to end up uh, being simulated in a Jupiter brain having swallowed everything. Uh, and if uh, the speed of light uh, is maximal in communication, then uh, Jupiter brains have a maximum size uh, because after that uh, they break apart, uh, not being able to synchronize their desire to swallow left or swallow right, uh, the next chunk of ma matter. Uh, even though uh, I shouldn't be chauvinistically attached uh, to base reality, um, and uh, I should be as happy uh, being simulated at whatever uh, degree as uh, I would be in being made of, uh, quotation marks, real atoms and real uh, molecules. Uh, what that is brings up a very important thing. The simulation argument, many people are super disturbed by the possibility that all of this is just uh, computer graphics and simulation. But in practice, if it was, what would it change? What, what an argument matters for is how it changes our behavior if we hear it. And the simulation argument is interesting because it kind of forces you to realize that the world is very likely a weirder place than you expect. Because the other two possibilities is that existential risk is a bigger problem or that future post-humans are really well coordinated and uh, really ethical, which is also a kind of a weird assumption. Um, so whatever happens, you need to update some things, but it's not that the simulation is doing any work. Uh, this is also how I deal with the faster and light issue in my book. Uh, but I'm following very much orthodox mainstream science as the base thing. And then I have an enormous chapter about all the weird ways we could be wrong about stuff, where I'm kind of outlining what are the implications if we allow faster light travel. 
and then, as you say, David, yeah, in that case, you could get uh, intelligent life taking over way more of a universe. And indeed, ancient aliens could have gotten here much easier. The Fermi paradox suddenly got zillions of times worse. Even worse, you also get time travel. So it's not just that your Jupiter brains can be uh, linked using faster than light uh, data buses across the universe. You can also get the computations from the future which means that intelligence at the end of the time is now going to be actively messing around with stuff. At this point, the scenario gets really weird. I kind of say, okay, I'm leaving you, dear reader, to figure out the more implications of it, because I certainly don't. Absolutely. Uh, so you mentioned the book. Is this book that you are in the process of writing or you have uh, completed it? Uh, I'm in the process of writing it. And uh, uh, I'm happy to say that now it started to converge. The manuscript is still 1,117 pages, but it's been hoovering about that page length for several weeks now, which is a good sign. I'm actually getting rid of stuff, compressing things, and then hopefully it can go back down to something that you can actually publish. Uh, so I'm and to and when, when you expect it to be ready? I think I'm going to be finishing up writing it this year, but then, of course, publishing it is going to take maybe another year. Fortunately, this is a book that is kind of, since it's so long term, it, even if it got published after the technological singularity, it would still be about the future. Indeed, the singularity is happening somewhere in chapter five. Uh, I'm dealing with it in a few pages, and then I'm going on for, then what? Uh, the, the really interesting thing is, can we reason about the far future? Can we reason about what advanced civilizations that have technologies we can't understand could and couldn't do? So that has been the, the big challenge in writing this. Because, of course, a lot of people hear it say, yeah, but what if we're wrong about everything? And from a philosophical standpoint, that's a very interesting question. How do you reason when you could be wrong about everything? And this is, of course, true in everyday life, too. It could be that the United States doesn't exist. It's some kind of weird media conspiracy or a hoax that have been perpetrated. It's not very likely, though. I think we will have enough personal evidence to think that, mm, yeah, America probably exists. Uh, but uh, you still have to deal with the fact that your uh, mind is fallible, your knowledge is fallible, and our understanding of how the world actually works could be totally wrong. It could be a computer simulation. It, it could be a dream in somebody's mind. Uh, it could be some even more infernally weird situation. So philosophers have been struggling with this uh, for a fair time. I'm trying to also put some numbers on it. See, can we do probability estimation? Or even better, decision making. If you think that the world is a dream that can end at any point in time, you should probably just eat, drink, and be merry over the last remaining uh, moments of that dream. If you think it's more long term, then you probably need to be long term and you have moral duties to others. So there are ways of reasoning about weird things. That's what I'm trying to demonstrate in the book, including doing methodologies for reasoning about future technologies. Uh, and uh, how do you um, incorporate the pandemic in your uh, uh, research and, uh, and analysis? Uh, is it something that uh, surprised you, that concerned you, that uh, you took for granted and given? both the fact and the reactions of the various nation states to it. So th that the pandemic showed up was not much of a surprise. If you look at the probabilities, uh, it's generally uh, the, uh, kind of, yeah, you should expect a few pandemics per century. Uh, that it was a coronavirus, even that was unsurprising. Uh, everybody kind of knew that the wet markets of China uh, are a breeding ground for getting zoonosis. And there are, of course, all the bird flu viruses circulating among the birds. So getting a viral pandemic uh, was not uh, surprising. That it happened when it happened, well, that's just a roll of the dice. Then the tricky thing is, of course, how did the world react? At this point, my intuitions, uh, I didn't have much intuitions about it. And they kind of, on one hand, some things happened like I would have expected. Many people start asking for locking down international communications and transport. Uh, other people get very nervous and chauvinistic and uh, adhere to the government. I was very surprised how well the scientific community, practically everybody who could, started doing something COVID-related. That's very cheering. I've been amazed at that response. I've also been kind of uh, astonished by how people start deba debating epidemiology, epistemology. Uh, 
here in Sweden, one of the big pastimes is, of course, arguing that what you believe about the government estimations and the strategies and the, the methods they reach those conclusions. This sounds almost like you would hear in a university department. So in the end, it's a mixed bunch. Uh, it's a very predictable kind of disaster. And it's a nice thing that COVID, for all its horrors, still is a dress rehearsal for something worse. It could have been like MERS, which is a way higher case fatality rate. This one is definitely survivable. It's hurting our economy. It's doing a lot of other stuff. But yeah, it's not that bad. The real question, and this is the one I think is important to deal with, is can we learn the right lessons when this is over? I already see that many people are very tired of the pandemic. There is a reason people immediately turn to the rioting and uh, police brutality in the United States as a big media thing, because at least it wasn't about that darn virus. The problem is the pandemic is still around. It's still growing. And when it's over, I think most of us want to have a holiday and not think about it at all. But at that point, there's a real risk that we choose to forget it. It happened in 1918 after uh, that uh, influenza pandemic that killed way more people. And even scholars at the time felt, whoa, tens of millions of people are dead. And everybody forgot about the flu from a few months ago. And it was more or less forgotten, uh, actually, for most of the century. So recently, when we started to realize pandemics are a thing. And I think this shows that we have a duty as intelligent people to not forget it, to make sure we remember the right lessons, whether that is, uh, for example, what interventions work. Rapid intervention seems to be much more important than what kind of interventions there is. Uh, countries that responded slowly but strongly got a worse outcome than the ones that responded lightly, is very fast. Uh, we need to honor the people who made sacrifices so we uh, uh, get other people willing to make sacrifices in the future. So we better raise big monuments of the league who stood up and uh, uh, warned people. We need to make sure about institutional systems based on that they are actually retained. What happened in China was that local go uh, government officials were kind of fudging things because they didn't like reporting stuff into those systems which delayed response a lot and probably led to the outbreak going global. But there's a lot of lessons here and we may not forget them. We have a kind of moral duty to remember that. But that's very different from what, how you normally think about the pandemic as just a disease and the solution is probably some vaccine and biotech. Yeah, we need that too. But if we only get that, but forget the lessons, then we're going to be in big trouble next time something bad comes along. And that could be way worse. Um, I was um, uh, very uh, interested in the variable rate of response from the various governments, uh, especially because uh, uh, the pandemic uh, is in the same class of problems as climate change, uh, uh, arms controls, and others that appear not to be tackled appropriately by uh, nation states because they were not designed, they didn't evolve uh, for a world that has these kinds of global challenges. And um, we, we are not uh, drawing the lessons uh, deeply enough yet. And my expectation is that the economic consequences are going to be harsher than uh, people expect. And those will drive uh, uh, a speedier change and an assessment of the role of the nation state and potential alternative organizations than uh, not uh, we would otherwise have. And, and, and that may be actually quite healthy because uh, it could lead uh, to, the, um, uh, to, to, to the appearing uh, of uh, socioeconomic organizations that are better uh, uh, adapted to tackle these global challenges instead. Yeah, I think that's definitely true. Uh, and some of them are kind of bottom up. Since we've been spending months, most of us, on uh, teleconferencing meetings, that is probably going to change a lot on how companies and organizations work. Do you really need that much office space? And also recognition of what parts of office is useful, like meeting of minds and dragging people in front of whiteboard with a new idea, which is much harder to do over a Skype or Zoom meeting. 
On the other hand, you have the institutions. The World Health Organization has not exactly had its finest hour. And it's pretty clear that it would be better to have something better. But what is that? You also have seen interesting things like the scientific community uh, demonstrating that you can actually switch modes of what you're working on. Normally, this doesn't happen in academia. If I'm working on uh, plant virology, I'm not going to deal with human virology. But now people realize that actually I can get back in the lab if I do something COVID related, or I can actually help out the people doing modeling, even though I might not know very much about human viruses. So there is a tremendous amount of flexibility that has demonstrated in other organizations. Uh, in Sweden, we like rules and regulations. And one reason um, uh, Sweden didn't lock that down very much was actually that it was constitutionally very tough. But the Swedish healthcare system, when they realized that they had a shortage of personal protective equipment, uh, local uh, managers realized, yeah, we need to change the rules here. Yeah, we have a rule against recycled plastic use in hospitals. But the 3D printed objects are recycled plastic by the standard. It would be stupid to give up face masks uh, that have been 3D printed because they're technically recycled. Let's just change that rule. Let's make a note that we're breaking a rule we made up earlier but for a good reason, and it works. So in some places, we have seen people actually changing and updating. In other places, like the CDC in the uh, United States, it looks like they have been following the rules to the letter, even when it doesn't make sense, even when it slows down testing. So. And again, yeah. these are important lessons to learn. You don't want too much flexibility because then you get too much chaos, you can't actually predict, it. but you don't want too much rigidity. And you want to know how to balance this and even have systems set up. So in many ways, as a dress rehearsal for a serious global disaster, this is worth having. It's still a disaster, but could be so much worse. Um, I, I agree. And uh, I, I am looking forward to be able to be together with other human beings uh, beyond my family uh, and to be able to hug. I'm a hugger. Uh, and uh, uh, I have uh, been uh, receiving invitations for conferences, uh, physical conferences uh, in the fall. They feel a little bit optimistic. I am ambivalent of uh, uh, them and, and uh, their ability to uh, safeguard the participants and the speakers, uh, but we, we will see. Uh, Anders, uh, it has been wonderful to have you on Searching for the Question Live. Good luck with uh, um, getting your arms around your humongous book and uh, getting it uh, to a dimension that the publisher will be happy with. And I am very much looking forward to, to reading it. Me too. Me too. But I really need to make it shorter because I realized that uh, 800 pages, that's about the sweet spot for actually being able to read it in bed. Uh, beyond that, it's going to be too heavy. So I really, really need to shorten it down. But of course, if, when thinking about the theme of it, shorting things down, distilling it into a general theory, that is what you ideally want to do. And then, of course, all the stuff I cut away, I'm going to put into another book, The Book of Lost Footnotes, where all the awesome sidetracks are copied. Thank Perfect. you so much for having me. And uh, let's ask more cool questions. Thank you very much. Uh, Thank you, everybody, for being uh, uh, with us today on uh, Searching for the Question Live. Um, if you uh, speak uh, Italian, uh, I invite you to also subscribe to my Italian YouTube channel, uh, which is in Italian, uh, and uh, with, of course, uh, different guests, uh, but uh, I hope always uh, interesting uh, themes. Um, you can also uh, subscribe to my uh, newsletter uh, where every week uh, I uh, talk about what is the context uh, for things that are happening and how you can have a, a, a deeper understanding of the, the topics that uh, go around. Uh, an interesting uh, opportunity is uh, to suggest uh, guests uh, for future episodes uh, and um, uh, to uh, vote on uh, uh, guests that uh, you would like to see. Uh, we also have a Discord uh, community, uh, and you can join it on davidorban.com slash Discord. 
uh, where we continue the conversations uh, and uh, have uh, the opportunity of text uh, chatting, which uh, is a nice mix of uh, synchronous and asynchronous uh, way of uh, going about debating uh, these themes. Uh, if you like uh, what you are hearing and seeing, uh, please uh, become a fan, a supporter, a sponsor, or a benefactor on uh, patreon.com slash David Orban. Thank you again, and uh, see you uh, at the next episode of Searching for the Question Live.